Okay, let's talk about conceptual massing in Revit. Uh, to start, you just begin with a new conceptual mass, and I have a template that I like to use for smaller elements. And what this has is uh, several uh, work planes, and it's a much smaller uh, object. In fact, I'm gonna set the scale to uh, half inch equals a foot, just so that it's a little easier to see things. Um, and basically, this conceptual modeling environment, you can draw on any reference plane. You can just double click on it to uh, draw on the reference plane. And objects, you know, come in like other Revit objects. Um, you can select them. What's neat, though, is you can uh, double click on reference planes or you can click the Set Plane Reference Tool. And now, this is my reference plane. And maybe I'll draw another rectangle up here. You can see they're both. Uh, drawing in three dimensions, uh, and I can just select them and end up basically creating a, a swept blend, uh, just like in the massing tools within Revit, and you can create solids or voids. Uh, and the voids are, of course, problematic, uh, like in um, standard uh, masses, in that they're hard to find. But anyway, what's neat is in this environment, you can select different parts of this object just by clicking on them, or as in uh, Revit, um, otherwise you can always hit tab and see how that allows you to grab whole objects. What's cool here is I can come and I can select the uh, individual pieces and this little gizmo allows me to uh, edit those individual pieces. I can uh, select a face and certainly edit that entire face. Um, what's cool too is you can select a point. So you can create some pretty interesting uh, objects just by dragging these points around. Um, or, or not. Some people don't, don't like that kind of geometry. Um, also, uh, when you are modeling this uh, object, um, you can uh, create kind of a multiple swept blend, I guess is what you would call it, by uh, adding what are called profiles and edges. And these are up here uh, on the uh, modify form uh, toolbar. Uh, if I add an edge in, you'll see that uh, it gives me a preview of where that edge is going to be. It basically wants to draw a vertical line. And uh, again, like uh, uh, with other objects, I can come and grab either the line and Revit will try to reform the uh, geometry um, or it will, uh, I can grab individual points and start mucking around with that. Of course, you can also get into a lot of trouble uh, doing this sort of thing because you can create some pretty irregular geometry. Um, but what's neat is that um, you can create some pretty fun forms. Let me just undo that for a second. And uh, the other thing that you can do uh, is adding a profile. And what that does, so it basically adds a horizontal edge to this um, uh, uh, mass. And uh, you don't have to have the whole mass selected. And you can see, again, a little preview of what it's gonna, where it's going to be. Click, click the profile. And now if I come in here and let's say I come and modify this top and move it around a little bit you can see it's it's bending around that profile and in fact you can create as many profiles as you want um, which is fun you can kind of create these i don't know snake-like uh, geometric objects that are really cool you can of course get into a lot of trouble doing this sort of thing because it can create geometry that revit doesn't like let's see if we can do that what I like to do sometimes is I'll take the uh, object and dissolve it into those uh, constituent parts. And then you can come in and you can do really anything you want to any of these individual parts. They are all on their own uh, reference plane. So you have to be careful when you modify these um, because you never actually, often you don't know which direction you're going and it can be quite confusing. But let's see if it'll let me create the form. Oh, it does. Look at that. All right, well, I tried. Anyway, there are a number of things that you can do with these models. I'm just going to undo back to a simpler form so that my model doesn't take forever to draw. Um, you can also uh, take an individual surface and divide it up. There's a divide surface tool. And again, you can use the help uh, that Revit gives you uh, if you uh, can't remember. And you can change the uh, numbers uh, in the grid here to whatever uh, design you want. And this is actually a great way if you're creating a uh, mass that's going to have a curtain wall in a as a main model. This is a great way to create that grid uh, right away. The other cool thing about this, uh, and this is uh, also for our project, uh, Pavilion, you can create um, kind of a physicality to this model just by changing um, its pattern. By default, it's just an empty grid. 
Um, but you can add in all sorts of different patterns here. Uh, just There's a lot of standard ones. And uh, what's really cool about these patterns uh, is, I'm going to just choose a rectangular one, um, it adapts to the grid. So if I change my size of my grid to uh, a larger number, the pattern will adapt. It changes its size. And you can create your own custom patterns uh, as well. Um, patterns are basically uh, a family. So you have to go to New Family. And uh, you have to scroll down in the list here and find a generic model, pattern-based. And uh, let's just open that up. And you can see it's a grid um, with these funny shaped objects. These are actually kind of drawing nodes that are glued to this adaptive grid. And, and you can set that grid to be any dimension you want. So you really should think about your model and what size it is. So uh, mine is uh, probably, I didn't actually pay attention when I was drawing it, but it's probably about a foot uh, more or less. And you can see it re resizes itself. Um, and there are a number of different kinds of grids, by the way. Um, and you can create uh, custom three-dimensional geometry on any of these grids. You can really create some interesting stuff. But anyway, the basic principle is that you use these nodes to create an adaptive three-dimensional component. So I'm just going to create a form using those nodes and create a little box, you know, a little, little sugar cube, load it into the project and uh, select my grid and what you'll see is that uh, the one oh I named it family seven I forgot to save it and give it a name which, but anyway it shows up underneath the the uh, base pattern that you used I do choose that you see how I've now got a little thickness to my glass uh, wall here and of course you can uh, like uh, any Revit object you can of course add um, materials to uh, the family um, another cool thing, let's say you don't want it to be a cube, but something a little more wacky. Um, you can unlock it from these reference nodes. Now what happens is I'm just going to unlock the top surface. That means the top surface I can make changes to, and maybe I'll make it a, a wedge shape here. Um, this top surface is no longer locked to this dynamic grid, which means that when I load it into the model, it will take whatever dimension I've drawn it at, which is roughly a foot square. This grid will take whatever dimension the grid is in the model. So you might get some pretty unusual results when you do this. Here what you see is my part that was not glued to that grid anymore. See how it's slightly twisted and it's slightly smaller than the grid I have on my model. And of course the, the back side of it is being adaptive. So if I were to change one of these numbers, you will see that the grid dimension should, should change, probably, <laughs> anyway. Oh yeah, see, it changes. Anyway, you can also add other things into the component. You know, these are masses, so you can, you can do all the fun massing things that we like to do, like, uh, let's draw, I don't know, a uh, hole in the object here. I'll just take a circle and create a void form, make a nice little, little kind of hill here or whatever it is. Um, I always get a little lost in three dimensions so it's a good idea to uh, make sure you know kind of where you are in three dimensions. Sometimes you have to really use the um, view cube to figure figure out what's <laughs> what's going on. Uh, anyway I think I've got it right. Oh yeah there we go. Now they overlap and I can use the cut geometry tool to uh, create my hole. Select that. Oh yes very nice load that into the project and I should see lots of holes and again I could try to glue the void onto the um, onto the grid or I could uh, just leave it as is uh, anyway so you've got a very nice uh, model okay great this is my um, pavilion that I'm going to be modeling uh, how do I uh, get um, a uh, Revit model out of it um, that I can render and also uh, one that I can send to the 3D printer. Well, uh, first of all, you need a new uh, project to put it into. You can't just um, use the conceptual mass. Click OK. And uh, sometimes when you come into this uh, main model, uh, you'll when you load your family into the main model, sometimes it doesn't show up. Let's, let's see what happens when we do it. 
Um, sometimes it does. So, oh yeah, there it is. We got lucky. I'll just place it right there. Escape. Very complicated models will, of course, slow your computer down. And uh, here's my model. If it doesn't show up, you, you might have to hunt for it here in the family browser. It's under masses. Uh, mine's called Family 6, apparently. because Again, because I didn't save it with my name. Uh, but they all show up in the masses. You can also check your visibility and graphic overrides to make sure you're showing mass. Uh, anyway, once you're in the model, you can do all sorts of fun stuff um, with it. Uh, a number of things that are unique to conceptual masses um, is that you can use them, you know, we can just apply materials, but we can also use them to create things like walls and floors. If I choose wall by face, and here, let's choose a uh, brick wall or something like that. When you move your mouse over the project, over the conceptual mass, it will create a building, and that is a, a building which accepts doors and windows and all that other good stuff. Um, and of course, uh, like our other um, projects, um, you can uh, add materials either within the component level or you can paint the conceptual mass. And this is great if you want to, say, create roofs that are a complicated form. You can use the roof by face tool and create roofs. Um, you can also do a, a really cool thing, um, which is uh, if you have a tall building, you can uh, use a feature of conceptual masses, which is called mass floors. You have to have levels in your project, but if you do, you just check off which levels you want, and uh, Revit will create a floor based on the uh, whatever irregular profile there is of uh, the conceptual mass. So it's pretty, pretty slick that way. Uh, the only last thing is um, for our particular project, you need to have um, a scale figure in here. You can just render it with the sun, and you can paint it some uh, material. But um, I would strongly recommend using our ArchVision uh, library. You can install it on your computer and license it. And it's a really great uh, tool to have and very easy. I'm just going to browse it uh, here uh, and choose a 3D model that you like. Here's a guy in a tuxedo. If you want it on your computer, you have to click the little 3D button for it to show up. See how it shows your recent downloads. And then it's a matter of just dragging that model into an orthogonal view um, let's see how Revit does. There we go. There is, what was his name? Adel. And um, uh, that's a really handy way to show the scale of these models. You know, they, uh, they're so hard to, um, uh, to tell uh, just, you know, from kind of a, uh, if you render it without a person in there. And, and you know, these RPC people, he's, he's, he's floating, I think. Maybe some ground would be good, but anyway, you can see the RPCs take um, the uh, shadow of the model uh, conditions uh, quite nicely. So anyway, that's basically it for conceptual massing. It's a great tool, and um, for us, when we and it's time to go to the 3D printer, uh, it's kind of a multi-step process. But uh, first of all, you'll have to export what's called an FBX, uh, and once you do that. Uh, Revit basically just says, you know, where, where do you want to put it and, and give it a name. Uh, and what we'll need to do is convert that FBX into something that, um, uh, that our MakerBot software can read. Um, uh, typically, we're going to open it in 3ds Max um, in class, and probably what I'll do is check it. Um, there are exporters that you can get uh, to go directly from uh, Revit, um, one of which I have posted on Canvas. Um, and you get a couple of uh, free exports for that. It actually has, they have a couple of exporters and one exports directly to SketchUp, which is another uh, good one to use. Um, so I would strongly uh, recommend if you think you're going to be doing a lot of 3D printing, um, go and get that uh, exporter, or if you think you're gonna be using um, a SketchUp rendering workflow. Well, anyway, that's it for conceptual massing.